Shabbat Shalom. I hope you are ready to learn something really interesting, really strange, really, really cool. I did this, uh, it, it, it came to me today, it, I realized finally that I wasn't taught anything about Judaism. And I've said that so many times, but it really came to my mind very clearly today because <clears throat> I got born again and came into Messianic Judaism and nobody in Messianic Judaism back then was teaching from the basic, basic things that, uh, that uh, Jewish people start studying when they're kids. When you're three or four years old, you start studying the Torah and you start studying uh, Davka, which is the Talmud. And it's a very systematic way to study it. I didn't do that. So now, you know, every week after week after week for years, last seven years basically, I read through the Torah and I'm like, oh my God, that is amazing. Then I read Rashi or I read in the Talmud. I'm like, where do they get this stuff from? And then they all quote each other like it's common knowledge. And I'm like, wow, that is amazing revelation. It's not amazing revelation. The Jewish people have had it for 4,000 years, and we were just too lazy or dumb or ignorant, just ignorant because we weren't taught it. But it's there. It's been there the whole time. These treasures, and to the Jewish people, these treasures are like, you know, breakfast cereal. Yeah, okay, go get it. Get it out of the cabinet, eat it. We do it every day. But to us, it's just like mind-blowing. So every week when I listen to a teaching by, or several teachings by Rabbi Anava or the other rabbis online, they say these things, and I, I got to rewind it and go, what? What? And I rewind it, listen to it again, what? I rewind it, listen to it again. And they say it like it's nothing. And out of this jumps an entire teaching. But to them, to the Jewish people, we're just ignorant of it, but it's been there the whole time. So what I'm, the reason I'm saying this is this. All of us are playing catch up. We're playing catch up. You gotta press in and play catch up better. That's what I'm doing. We gotta press in and pay, play catch up better than we are because the kingdom is coming very soon and we're going to be like, okay, we're going in the kingdom, but we, we don't know anything. And that's no good. I mean, it would be better to know as much as we can before the kingdom. So this teaching is called, It's God's Business. And it doesn't mean like, leave it alone, that's God's business. It's the other thing. It's God's business, business, money, business, like buying and selling. God has a very, very particular and upside down to us way of doing business. You probably know this by now, that everything he does business-wise is the opposite of what we think it should be because we're trained in the, in the way of where Abraham came from. He came into Israel with God and God retaught him everything. But he lived 75 years where? Where did Abraham come from? Indian. No, not or Midian. Or, huh? or, or. or of what? Where's or? Or. What is that? Where is that? Babylon. 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 So he came out of Babylon when God called him, and he had all 75 years worth of stuff that he learned about, you know, from Babylon, and he had to relearn everything. Well, God has business. The, the rabbis say this. They say, <laughs> like one of the very first things in, in Pirkei Avot, in the, uh, that we read every Shabbat, they say, make it your business to know God. Like it's talking about like doing business, like making money. And it says, don't worry about that. Make God your business. And he literally uses the word business, like money making. Make God your business. And this is to every Jew, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna read two portions from the Torah portion and it's, I'm going to take these two portions, and they basically have, it's going to sound like completely different messages that I'm going to talk about, but then they're going to come together into one message. Okay? Got it? Yes. All right, so we're going to go to Bereshit 23. Starts out, Chayai Sarah, the life of Sarah, and then talks about that she dies. 
And then she never shows up for the rest of the Torah portion. But the name of the Torah portion is the life of Sarah. Anybody know why Sarah died? The rabbis say why she died. How did, why did she die? She stopped breathing. Why did she? <laughs> head of the class. Why did she? Why did she die? You taught last year is because she saw Isaac, so she knew the promise was fulfilled. Opposite. She that happened earlier. She heard. She heard that he died that, and had a broken heart. Yes, she heard that about the Akedah, and that Abraham was going to kill their son, and her spirit left her in grief because she's going to lose the only thing she ever wanted. So that's that's when she died. So Sarah lived a hundred years and twenty years and seven years. Taught this about four years ago. Fantastic teaching about the hundred years separate from the twenty years, separate from the seven years, why they're separated. The years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, the city of the four, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Avraham uh, came in to eulogize Sarah and to weep for her. This is backwards. It should say weep for her and then eulogize her, but it doesn't. Why? Because he had to hold himself together to eulogize her, and then he wept in private. This is a big deal. I can't talk about the whole thing right now, but it basically goes back to what I taught a couple weeks ago. Very important teaching. What's better, walking with God or walking before God? Before. Before the Lord. Walking before the Lord. This has to do with that, holding himself, making himself hard and mature and stable, and then later on in private he grieves. And there's a lot the rabbis say about this. It's, it's maturity. Then Abraham arose from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Chet, not Chet, saying, I am a stranger and an alien among you. Give me a burial site among you so I can bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Chet answered, You're a prince of God among us. Uh-oh. Okay. When they say something like that to a person doing Judaism, what does that mean? Do you know? Fucking so respect them. You got something I want. Yeah. Money. You're a prince. Remember, these are Gentiles in Hebron. And they see this guy who's making money, hand over fist. Abraham was a gazillionaire. He was the richest guy in the entire Middle East. And they see that, and they want that. And they say, look, look, you're a, you're a prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. Nobody's going to refuse you his grave for burying your dead. So Abraham spoke. Listen, I want you to plead, like beg, Ephron, son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the field, or the, sorry, the cave of Machpelah that he owns, which is at the end of his field. Look what he says. Mm -hmm. Give it to me. What does that say? Full price. For the full price. Not give it to me and walk away. Give it to me for the full price. He's, he, he's willing and knows he has to pay for it. Now, at this point, the Jews, well, he's the only Jew and his son Isaac, and they own nothing. They own no land. God said, I'm going to give you that land. They don't own it, right? They own nothing. Not they own stuff, but they own no land. And he says, I need to buy that. It's in Hebron. I need to buy it for the full price. Let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. Ephron was sitting among the sons of Chet, and Ephron the Hittite. And what does he keep? You're going to see a lot of repetition of his name, and there's no need for it. Why does the Torah keep repeating um, Ephron? It doesn't have to. It can just say he. Uh, let's see. Ephron was sitting among the sons of Chet, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham, No, my lord, listen to me. I give, you the, I give you the field, and I give you the cave that's in it. Abraham bowed, and he spoke to Ephron. Please, listen to me. I'll give the price of the field. Accept it. Ephron answered, My lord, listen to me. $150 quadrillion, what is that between us? <laughs> He goes from zero to four, uh, 400 shekels of silver, which it, it's, it's 
A couple million bucks. That's a lot. Huh? That's a couple million bucks to us. He goes from nothing to a couple million dollars. So this is not, you know, Ephron is so gracious. He's in front of his crew and he says, I give it to you, Abraham. Look, uh, you know, a couple million bucks. What's that between us? He's after the money. He wants that money, which I will show you. I'll prove it to you. So he says, what's that between you and me? Bury your dead. Avraham listened to Ephron, and he weighed out for Ephron the silver. Why doesn't it just say he listened to Ephron and he weighed out the silver? He keeps repeating his name over and over again, and there's no need for it. Weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the presence of the sons of Chet. See, he's in front of his crew, and he named the price. So now it's a business deal. 400 shekels of silver. And then look how it ends. Acceptable to the merchant. Davida's favorite word, the merchant. She hates that word, merchant. 400 shekels of silver, acceptable to the merchant. Now that's in the Torah, in God's word. There's no word, there's no letter, there's no, not even a space that doesn't mean something in the Torah. It's there by God, it's there for a reason. So why does it say at the end of this whole deal, acceptable to the merchant? Now the word merchant here is the word socher. So that tells me we got to look at the word socher. Because it's acceptable to whoever a socher is. Is it acceptable to God? So what I'm going to show you is it's two totally different things. So, you know, Abraham was promised the land by God. So why does he have to buy? That's my question. If he was promised all the land, what's he given money for? God said, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. Hand it over. But Abraham says, no, I've got to buy that. In Genesis 12, Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanites were in the land at that time. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your seed. This is the first time. I got these numbered. One, two, three, four, five, six. By the way, how many times did it repeat Ephron? Anybody pick? Seven. Seven. Okay. So, uh, Genesis 12, first time, to your seed I will give. He doesn't say I'll sell the land. He doesn't say I'll give part of it and some of it you have to buy. He says I'm going to give you the whole thing up front. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. Genesis 13, next chapter. The Lord said to Avram, after Lot had separated from him, now raise your eyes, look from the place where you are. Now where he is, anybody remember where he is? Hebron. 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 Good. To the place, from the place where you are, north, south, east, and west, all the land you can see I'm going to give to you and to your seed forever. I will make your seed as plentiful as the dust of the earth. Free Palestine! Yeah, free Palestine. By the way, Palestine is not a dirty word. It's not evil. It doesn't mean Philistine. That's what we were taught. It does not mean Philistine. I thought it meant foreigner. No, it does not mean foreigner either. It was named that by the Romans. And that land was called Palestine. It's just the land of Israel. Free Palestine. So God's giving the land of Israel to Israel. And, I'm sorry, to Abraham and to his seed forever. All right. Where, where does he say he's got to buy some of it? All the land that you see I'll give to you and your seed forever. I'll make your seed as plentiful as the dust of the earth. So that if somebody can count the dust of the earth, then your seed could be counted. Number three, get up, arise, walk throughout the whole land. Did Abraham, I taught this two weeks ago. Did Abraham walk through the whole land? No. Not even close. He tells him, arise, walk about in the land through its length and its width. I'm going to give the whole thing to you. So we know it's not the land, it's the kingdom. So he's basically telling him, go to the kingdom and walk through that whole kingdom by doing Judaism. Genesis 15, the next one. He believed the Lord and, he, and God credited it to him as righteousness. And he said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chazdim, which is Babylon. He took Abraham out of Babylon to give you this land to possess it. But he said, Lord God, how can I know I'm going to possess it? When the sun had set, it was very dark and there was a smoking oven. You know those small Middle Eastern ovens? 
can't remember what they're called. I have them in New Mexico all over the place. Little ovens like that big. So there's an oven floating through the midst of these animals that are cut in half and it followed by a torch. It's like an oven, like a regular old oven. And it's floating through the, in between the pieces. And then there's a torch that floats in between the pieces and that's God making a covenant with Abraham. A and then a flaming torch passed between the pieces. In that day, in that day, it says, in that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. When is that day? Kingdom. So the kingdom, it was in the kingdom that God made the covenant with Abraham. Mm -hmm. Made a covenant with, Ab with Avram, saying, To your seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt. Now, I don't know if the, that's Nahal Mitzrayim, which is the southern border of, of Israel today, or if it's the Nile, and nobody knows. The, uh, the rabbis argue back and forth about this. Does the land of Israel go all the way from the Euphrates, from Assyria, all the way to Egypt? Or does it stop at the basically what's the southern border of, it, of Israel today? I will give, uh, number six, I will give to you and to your seed the land where you live as a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession. I'm going to be their God. So God promises him six times, I'm going to give you the land. And then he has to buy. Yeah. Doesn't that bother you? No. That bothers me. Like, you said you are going to give it to me. Why, am I, why do I have to put on money? And yet Abraham had to fight for the right to put that money out. Well, yeah, because he wanted to give it to him. Who wanted to give what to who? Ephron. Said, Ephron wanted, yeah, he said, I'll give you, although that was a marketing technique. Right. It wasn't honest. That was a way to make cash. But Abraham had to, like, fight for it. Like, I want to pay for this. That was a lot of money. So here's the verse we're going to be looking at. For the full price, let him give it to me. Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham, I give you the field and give you the cave that's in it. And Abraham bowed. He has to like, like negotiate up. Have you ever? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. He's negotiating up instead of negotiating down. Ephron is saying, take it. I'll give it to you. No, no. I want to pay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, you know, I'll give it to you. You're, you're fine, Jew. No, no, no. I want to pay for it. It's, he's negotiating up. I give you the cave that's in it. Abraham bowed and spoke to Ephron. Please, please listen to me. Shema na. Na means please, like begging. Shema na. Please listen to me. I'm going to give the price of the field. Accept it. Take it. Ephron answered, my Lord, listen to me. Land worth $150 billion. What is that between you and me? So... Again, if God was giving it to him, why does he have to pay? I thought gave him the money. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Chris said, because God gave him the money. You're correct. So, this is what uh, it says in Bereshit Rabbah. The big story is about the Torah. He purchased the field where he had pitched his tent for 100 kesita. Now, this is not about Abraham. This is about Jacob. Kesita is the name of a coin. Rabbi Yudan Bar Shimon said this is one of three places that the nations of the world cannot deride, that means make fun of, put down Israel and say that you have stolen property, free Palestine. They can't say that because there's three places in Israel that money was put out to buy those locations. These are the cave of Machpelah, Abraham put out 400 shekels of silver. The temple, who bought that? And Joseph's tomb, right? Joseph's tomb. Who bought Joseph's tomb? Jeremiah. Okay, so now, so here I have uh, the other two for you. Genesis 33, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. He bought, bought the plot of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father. 
for a hundred casita. Now, it probably says in your Bible, a hundred pieces of money. It's a casita. But casita is a, a specific coin. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Yisrael. Where is this? Where is this? Shechem. Yeah, but where? Where is this? Shechem. 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 Say Shechem. 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 You got to work up your, your spit. Shechem. Shechem. And that means uh, portion or shoulder. So Jacob bought the plot of land where Joseph's bones was going to go. He didn't have to do that. God said he was going to give him the land, but he bought. First Chronicles 21. Then the angel of the Lord told God to say to David, David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the thre threshing floor of Arnon, the Jebusite. So David went up. As David came to Arnon, he looked and he saw David, and he went out from the threshing floor, and he bowed before David. And David said, give me the sight of this, this threshing floor. It sounds like he's like saying, give it to me, but he's not. He's doing the same thing Abraham did. He said, give me the field, give me the cave, but I want to pay for it. So he says, give me the site of the threshing floor that I can build on it and alter to the Lord. For the full price you shall give it to me. That's exactly word for word what Abraham said, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. That the plague may be restrained from the people. Arnon said, take it. Now this is not like uh, Ephron. He's saying, take it. Uh, let my Lord do whatever is good in his sight. Look, I'm giving the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing, threshing sledges, which are big giant pieces of wood, for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I'll give it, I'll give it all. And David said to Aaron, no, I will never give, look at this, I will surely buy it for the full price because I will never take what is yours for the Lord or offer an ola which costs me nothing. I'll never give a sacrifice to God that doesn't cost me, which is why it's called a sacrifice. It has to cost. Now in Hebrew, the, there's two words for sacrifice. One is karban, which means drawing near, a drawing near thing. You know, we draw near to God with the sacrifice. But there's also zavach, which means slaughtering which is translated as sacrifice because it is a sacrifice. You have to give it. So this, these examples and the example that Abraham did is how you do God's business. It's got to cost everything. It's got to cost everything. It's got to cost you or else you're not, I mean, you could just do it for anybody. But to do it for God, it's got to cost. It's got to cost us. Do you understand what I'm saying? All yes. of a sudden, you got really quiet. Mm -hmm. We're broke. It, it has to, we're broke, right? Yeah. It has to cost. Or else it's not a Jewish way to worship. It's called service. This is a painting that I manufactured. I took five or six paintings from the 18, late 1800s and cobble them together into this scene so you can see it in your mind. This is Ephron and Abraham before the other, you know, Ephron's crew in the gate. And I want you to see it so you can understand what's happening here. Ephron's in red? No, Ephron has the red sash. Yeah. He's the one going, ah, oh, okay. 400 oh, okay. shekels. What is that between you and me? And Abraham's going, look, listen, I, I really want to pay this. All right. So look at it again. Now, now these, these are the verses we're going to be looking at for the next few minutes. And we're going to look at a big subject from this that God showed me. Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver which he had named in the presence of the sons of Chet. 400 shekels of silver, acceptable to the merchant. That's what I want to focus on. Acceptable to the merchant. What does that mean? Why is that in the Torah? Why did God say? That didn't have to be in there. All I had to do was say, and everybody was happy with the deal. <laughs> We're all happy. But it doesn't. It says, 
the merchants were satisfied. So here's, here's the passage again. No, my Lord, listen to me. The field I have given to you in the cave, my Lord, listen to me. Land worth 400 shekels of silver. You see how Abraham's begging? He's being forced to like plead his case so he can give money. He says it twice. He says, no, my Lord, listen to me. The field I've given to you in the cave. My Lord, listen to me. Land worth 400 shekels of silver. So Rabbi Hanina said, all the shekels that are stated in the Torah refer to selaim. In the prophets, they're called litrin. It's a different word. In the writings, they're called, in Greek, centenaria. So what it's saying is this. It's saying that this money that Ephron is asking for because Abraham is forced to beg to give the money, and Ephron begs for the money. Ephron says, no, my Lord, listen to me, the field I've given to you. He's saying, listen, listen, I'm begging you. Listen to me, I'm giving it to you. And then he says, my Lord, listen to me, land worth 400 shekels, what is that between us? But Abraham does just the opposite. He says, listen to me, Ephron, listen to me, I want to give. And then they fight back and forth. And then he says it again. Listen to me. I want to give this. So they're both saying, listen to me. But one is saying, because I want. And the other one is saying, I want to give. And they're two totally different. And listen, yesterday we were with Gentiles, Eileen and I, who don't know anything about anything. They're just normal, regular people. And, and they're nice people. And one of the nicest persons, she says, we were talking about burial in Judaism and burial in the Gentile world. And there's a perfect picture here in El Paso. The cemetery for the Gentiles is barren. And they said this, barren. Nothing grows there. It's dirt. But connected to the cemetery is a big green part. And I told them, that's the Jewish cemetery. Really? I always wondered that. Why is it green? I said, because we give. Because Jews always give to our Jewish community. Oh, yeah, she says. And, and, and innocently. I don't, I don't fault her for it. Say, yeah, Jews have a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, well, it's set up that way on purpose. We give to our community. We give everything to our community. Why? So that nobody's without in our community. And if you go by the cemetery, when you drive by the cemetery, look at it when you're on the freeway. You're going to see this big green part right by the freeway. That's the Jewish cemetery. And right behind it is the Gentile cemetery, as barren as it can be. Well, this is on purpose. This is done on purpose. So I want you to see that there's a difference in how money is exchanged in Judaism and in the Gentile world. You probably know this in your head, but I'm going to make it very, very clear in, this, in the teaching. I hope. That's what I'm shooting for anyway. So this is what it says. It says there's this coin that shows up all throughout the Bible. In the Torah, it's called Selaim. In the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the prophets, it's called uh, Litrin. And in the writings, later on, it's called Centenaria. Rabbi Yudin said the exception... There's one exception in the whole Torah, and it's this one. There's one exception. It's the shekels of Ephron, which were only centenaria. But that only shows up in the writings. It only shows up in the writings. So that is what is written. A greedy man rushes after wealth, and does not know that want will fall, befall him. I used to have a, a friend who was in a Messianic congregation with me, a Jewish guy. And this guy had gotten into the prosperity movement really strong. And he was convinced, nobody could convince him otherwise of this, that if you claim scriptures, you will get money. Now he's a Jew, and he's a Messianic Jew. And, and so he doesn't know from Judaism how to make money. 
He knows it from Christianity. And I kept, I finally got up the guts to quote this verse to him. It took me a long time. And I said, don't you know that the scriptures say the one who runs after money, runs after wealth, the money makes itself wings and flies away like a bird. Oh, he got so mad. He got so mad at me. No, the Bible says, and he started quoting all these verses that the prosperity movement quotes. I said, yeah, but that verse is still there. It didn't go away. It didn't get replaced with something. It's still in the Bible. So that's what it's saying here. It's a different verse, but it's basically saying the same thing. A greedy man runs, rushes, runs after wealth. This refers to Ephron, who cast a greedy eye on the wealth of the righteous man, Abraham. By demanding an exorbitant price of his field. Now we read 400 shekels, we're like, yeah, okay, big deal, no big deal. No, this is millions and millions of dollars. How much oh. is a shekel? It changes all the time, but you're going to have to do the research on your own. If you Google shekel valuation modern day, you'll find out. But this is not like the shekel of the modern day. Shekel of the modern day isn't worth anything. It's worth a quarter or something like that. Back then, if you Google shekels in the Bible times, it'll give you a whole list of valuations and how it changed. This is over, this is millions of dollars, 400 shekels. So he demands an exorbitant price of his field. Now look at what it says. Then it says, he doesn't know that want or diminishment will happen to him. Want means like taking away from you, diminished. In the Bible, there's all these verses, all these words that have a diminished letter, like a letter is taken out, and it means something, or smaller, or smaller and it means something. This says that the, tor the Torah diminished the letter Vav from Ephron. This is what is written. Abraham heard Ephron, heard him, and weighed for Ephron the silver. Ephron is written without a Vav, is written with a vav throughout the passage until he shows greed, then it's written without a vav. Isn't that amazing? Whoa. So I counted up. How many times did Ephron show up? It wasn't six, it was seven. It was seven. Ephron, 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 and then the last one, it's missing the vav. Okay? God pulled the vav out of his name. The Vav is in the name of God, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And yeah. God pulled it out of him when he showed his greed. So now. Okay, two things, at least. Okay, um, Ephron is a sing means a singing bird. No, Ephron means a heifer. Uh, I looked it up and it said also singing bird. It means okay. a heifer. All right, that being the case. Singing heifer? <laughs> <laughs> a flying heifer? <laughs> well, it may be it, because I saw it said singing bird. And the money flies and away. And the money flies away. Yes. But also. We'll have to check of, that connection. Yeah, and the day of the Lord, the birds. We're not there yet. Okay, but We're wait, not wait, there. wait, wait. That's We're not the, there yet. I want right. to get there. Great. That's the one thing. Then the second thing, the diminished bob. The bob is like a hook. Okay. Mm -hmm. the bob is a hook. The bob is a hook. So it's like all those six times, there's a hook pulling, pulling, pulling for the Ooh. money. But once you, he has that money, there's, the no, more there's no more hook. There's he's, no more hook. Yeah, very good. Do you understand what she's saying? That all six times, there's a hook in his name. And it's hooking him. It's pulling him. But then once he shows the greed, hook's gone. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So why seven times? Seven is usually good, right? Usually. Well... The day of the Lord is the seventh day. Mm -hmm. So Ephron should show up in the seventh day. Mm. He should show up in the seventh day as a bad guy. Mm. As a bad guy. Okay? So this is very important that, that it's in the day of the Lord. This, this act that I did this picture of, of Ephron and Abraham, this is going to be repeated in the day of the Lord, only on a global scale. The Gentiles are going to say, give us the money. Free Palestine. Give it to us. 
And the Jews are going to be like, look, I, I want to give to God. I want to give for the land. May, let me give. And this is going to be repeated. So we should see prophet. Did you follow that? Yes. A couple of you are confused. Did you follow that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what we should see is Ephron show up in the day of the Lord as the ultimate bad guy. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, go ahead. One last thing. Um, in Genesis, where it said, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created the earth. He creates the earth. And the reason, and, and um, I had read, the sages had said, you know, why is it written like that? Because he's saying, this earth, this land belongs to you, Israel, from the very beginning. And we're saying that from the beginning, so because it will come a time when some will try to take the land away from you. Yeah. But I have given it to you. From, from the beginning. The, from the I've beginning. I've given you the land from the very, very beginning because the time will come, and it's in the day of the Lord, yeah. when all the nations will try to take the land away and, from you. And all you, the nations. And you paid for it. You paid for it. Because they're going to say, hey, this is our land. No, no. We have the deed. Okay. We paid for it. So, who were the three people that bought parts of Israel? Abraham, Abraham, Abraham first, Abraham. Jacob. Jacob second. Where did Jacob buy land? Shechem. Shechem. And who's the third? David. David bought the temple, the temple site. All right. So that's right. The time is going to come in the day of the Lord where Ephron, with all his oily, kind, benevolent ways, tries to steal the land. But Abraham, in his kindness, in his his Humility is going to want to give for the land. Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he named in the presence of the sons of Chet, 400 shekels of silver acceptable to the merchant. And that's what we're going to look at. This is the ultimate bad guy in the, in the, in the day of the Lord. Who is the ultimate bad guy in the day, in the day of the Lord? What's his name? <laughs> you should have immediately said it. Amalek. Amalek or Amalek or Esau. 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 Edom. Yes. Edom. Hello. Rome. Edom. Red. Oh my gosh! You should know this immediately. Jacob is the good guy. Who's the bad guy? Edom. Edom or Esau. Yes. Yes. It says in Ma <laughs> Come on. It says in Malachi chapter one. Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. The only person in the whole Bible that God says he hated. The only one. So he's the ultimate bad guy. So, Ephron is in the same family of, as, of, as Edom. He's in the same family as Ishmael. Okay? Yeah. He's from Babylon. He's from Babylon. He lives in, in down in, uh, in Hebron. But he's from his family's from Babylon. It's Iran. Well, it's it's not Iran. In the story, it's not Iran. Oh. In the story, it's Babylon, Babel. Right. So what we're going to find is that the merchant is the ultimate bad guy in the day of the Lord. Merchant is not good. It's bad. It's the ultimate bad. So we need to, let's say this again. I know this is kind of hard to figure out. We need to learn how to do business for God, with God. Rabbi, one of my favorite rabbis, Rabbi Yosef Yosel from the 1880s in Russia. He is one of my heroes. And he said, it's one of, one of his greatest statements he ever said. A righteous man should know how to buy a cord of wood for a good price. Who cares? That's one of the greatest statements he ever made. A righteous man, a man who is righteous, who is doing Judaism, and knows how to do things properly, should be able to buy a cord of wood, you know, just firewood, nothing, for a good price. In other words, every single thing that we do in Judaism elevates our life. What we eat is to be elevated. How we make love is supposed to be elevated. What we wear is supposed to be elevated. Where we go, 
in our conversation. Everything about our life is to be elevated by Judaism. That includes what we buy and sell. So, the word merchant, which is the opposite of God's business, is one of the words is sachar, and it's a, it means to travel around, you know, like a peddler. Another word that Davida hates. A peddler, a merchant, goes around, he sells his wares, buys things. It also means intensively, like to do something real intense, to palpitate. You know what palpitate means? Yeah, your heart, you know, beating real fast. To go about, a merchant man, to occupy with, to pant. <laughs> Does that sound good? No. Palpitate, pant. Oh, got to get this done. Got to make that money. Got to get that cash. How can I do it? How can I do it? How can I do it? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? I got to make something happen here, baby. I got to make it happen. That's a merchant. As opposed to hmm. Judaism, which is the opposite. To trade, to traffic. Now Isaiah 23, and then there's another passage in Isaiah that I don't have here, and then all the rest of these are in Ezekiel. And you're going to look, these are about the merchant, but they're about the day of the Lord. So who's the merchant, and what is the merchant in the day of the Lord? Remember what we're looking at. Buying the land of Israel was 400 shekels, which was acceptable to who? The merchant. The merchant, the merchant right, the bad guy, the socher. Isaiah 23, he stretched out his hand over the sea and he shook the kingdoms. The Lord has spoken against the merchant. Now, get this. guess what word merchant is here? Kanaan. Kanaan. Wow. Kana That's what Kanaan means, merchant. <clears throat> the whole land of Israel was a land of merchants. And then God takes one dude and brings him in there and says, here, we're going to do something different. Judaism. Where does it say that Abraham did Judaism? Genesis 26, verse 5. Very good. Genesis 26, 5. You guys should know this off the back of your brain immediately. Genesis 26, 5. Because Abraham, uh, Isaac, I'm giving you the land because Abraham kept my watch. Yes? yes. What else did he keep? My statutes, my statutes, Chokim, what else? My Mishmar, my Mishmarim, my, my watches, Mishpatim, judgments, and Torot. Okay? Genesis 26, 5. You should know that verse. So he takes Abraham into the land of merchants. It is nothing but merchants. Go to the... Well, let me say it this way. Have any of you ever... Uh, try to do business with the Middle Eastern yep. uh, yes. in the Middle East? Yes. No. <laughs> it's totally different. You, if you do it in America with the Middle Eastern, you get a thimbleful. It's not the real thing. You go to the Middle East and you try to do business with the Middle Eastern, they run circles around you. Oh, yeah. Every trick you can, you can't even imagine the tricks and the techniques. It is amazing how they do business. And these, you know, Americans like us, we go to Israel like, oh, we're going to go to the Via de la Rosa, to the Shuk, and we're going to make a deal. We're going to make a deal on a chess set made out of onyx and olive wood. And they gouge you like crazy. And, they, and you leave thinking, I made a deal. And this happens a million times a day in Israel and on the other lands of the Middle East. They are expert at it. The whole land of Israel was the land of Canaan, the merchant. And then Abraham's going to do just the opposite. So how does God feel about the merchant? What is this story that God is weaving? And I'm going to show you the picture again. This is the story that God is weaving for the day of the Lord. Here's Abraham. He's at the gate with all these other merchants and with the ultimate merchant, Ephron, who God takes the vav out of his name when he shows greed. He's the ultimate merchant. And this is going to be, again, in the day of the Lord, Ezekiel 27. Now, if you read Ezekiel 27, and you should, there's dozens of verses. I only have 
one, two, three, four, five <laughs> verses. There's dozens of verses that say the same thing. I only picked a few of them. Say to Tyre. You guys know where Tyre is? Greece. Gr no. Oh, is it to Tyre? Mm -mm. It's in Israel. Tyre is one of the greatest cities of the Middle East. It's in Lebanon. Guess what? It's in the land of Asher. It says in Joshua that Tyre and Sidon are in the territory of the, the tribe of Asher in Israel. Now this was a great, great, great city and it was off out in the ocean. Like you had to cross a causeway to get, you know, you had to, like, like the bridges that go from like when you're coming into New Orleans, that elevated uh, I-10, yeah. how it's up, and it goes for miles and miles um, to get to New Orleans. And you, there's nowhere to get off because it's swamp. You're out there in the swamp. Well, here, it was a few hundred meters, and you'd go across this causeway, and you'd come to this huge castle, like walls that are not anywhere else in the Middle East and for another couple thousand years. And the, they tried, and they tried, and they tried to take Tyre. Nobody could take it. Babylonians couldn't do it. Nobody could do it. Until, finally, anybody know who took Tyre? Alexander the Great. Very good. Alexander the Great finally took Tyre. It was a great accomplishment. Tyre is Hasatan. In this chapter, Ezekiel 27, it's talking about Hasatan. And it's, it starts out by saying, and you, Tyre, this and this and this and this and this. And then he says, you're Hasatan. You're the Keruv who was in heaven, walking in the stones of fire until iniquity was found in you and you were cast out. This is, this is, so Tyre is Hasatan. Say to Tyre, O oh, you situated at the entry of the sea, O oh, merchant trafficker. This is a different word. This is Rachal. Merchant or trafficker of the people of many, for many islands. The islands is Greece. This is Hellenism. Isn't it interesting that Alexander was the one who took Tyre? Right. The one who started Hellenism. But he was the one who took Tyre. And that was a picture. To establish Hellenism in Tyre. O Tyre, you have said, I am of perfect beauty. Then it starts describing Hasatan. Now I have here, see Revelation 18. So we're going to see Revelation 18 because it quotes this. Ezekiel 27, 12. Tarshish was your merchant. No, this is the word Sachar. By reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches with silver and iron and tin and lead and they traded for your wares. Verse 16. Syria was your merchant, your Sachar. By reason of the multitude of your handiwork, they traded in your wares with emeralds and purple, embroidered work, fine linen, coral, agate. Ezekiel 27, 18. Damascus was your merchant. This is also Sachar. By reason of the multitude of your handiwork, for the multitude of all riches, in the wine of Helbon and white wool. And then 20 through 22, Dedan. This is now the Arab lands in Arabia. Dedan was your merchant trafficker. This is the word Rachal again. In precious clothes for writing. Arabia. Hmm. And all the princes of Kedar. That's in Arabia. They were your merchants. In lambs and rams and goats. In these, they were your merchants. The merchants, the traffickers. Rachal of Sheva. She you know where Sheva is? Yemen. That's Yemen. Hmm. And Ra'ama, they were your merchants, your traffickers. They traded for your wares with the chief of all spices and with all precious stones and gold. What it's, if you read this chapter, every nation on earth is feeding and doing business and trade and merchandise with whoever he's talking to in, Eze in Ezekiel 27. Who's he talking to? Hasatan. Yeah, but what's the name of? Tyre. 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 All of chapter 27 is about Tyre. He's addressing Tyre and he's saying, Tyre, you did business with the whole world as a merchant and they were your merchants and you did merchandise together. But guess what? Ezekiel 27 says, in that day. 
Isaiah 23 says, in that day. So what does that tell us? That tells us, tell me what that tells us. It's in the kingdom. What's in the kingdom? Tyre. Merchants. The merchants doing business with Tyre is in the kingdom. We should be, so tell me, where is that? Where, where is that in the Bible? That it says that there's going to be all this merchandise going back and forth, forth in, in the day of the Lord. There's a chapter talking about the mark of the beast, and if you don't have it, you can't... So you're saying in the book of Revelation? Yes. That's it? It's in the book of Revelation, which is in the day of the Lord, yes? Yes. Okay. So let's look at it. <coughs> Acceptable to the merchant. That's what we're looking at. Revelation 18.3, For all the nations have fallen. Why? Because of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Her being Babylon. I thought it was Tyre. Yes. Now it's Babylon. Yeah, exactly. Now it's Babylon. So what I'm telling you is this. Where did Abraham come from? Babylon. Quit saying or. Where is that? Babylon. Babylon. He's a Babylonian. He comes out of Babylon. God calls him out of Babylon. Yes? Yes. And he goes to Israel. All of these Canaanites have traffic with Babylon. Babylon is the ultimate picture of evil nations, plural, in the Bible. Tyre is just one city, but it's also, it is Babylon. If you, look, if you read all the verses about Tyre, you read all the verses about Babylon, you will see that God says the same exact thing about the, the two of them. So once you come to Revelation 18, don't read Babylon, read Tyre. Babylon and Tyre, because they're the same thing. All the nations have fallen because of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, with Babylon Tyre, and the merchants of the earth have become rich from the excessive wealth of her luxury. Okay, this is in the day of the Lord. This is the birth pangs. Chapter 18 also, verse 11 through 13. Now, I couldn't quote the whole thing of Revelation 18. Just like I couldn't quote the whole thing of Ezekiel 20, 20, no, not 27. Ezekiel 20, yeah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 27, thank you. I couldn't quote that whole thing. There's just not enough room. But it's word for word the same shopping list that's in Ezekiel uh, 27. It's the same shopping list. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her, over Babylon Tyre, because no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all citron wood and ivory and every article from valuable wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spices and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and horses and carriages and slaves and human lives. And every one of these words appears in Ezekiel 27. This is quoting Ezekiel 27. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the Tanakh, you cannot understand the New Testament, period. Yep. You are lost if you don't understand what it's quoting in the Tanakh. It's quoting Ezekiel 27 about the merchants. And so then that's why he says the merchants of the earth. Revelation 18, the merchants of these things, verse 15, who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning. This is also in Ezekiel 27. It says that you're, you're in ships, and the ships will be off, you know, off the land, and they will be astonished watching the destruction. It says it in Ezekiel 27. Revelation 18, 23. And the light of a lamp will never shine in you again, Babylon, and the voice of the groom and bride will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the powerful people of the earth because all the nations were deceived by your witchcraft. And what I want you to see is this. The worst thing you can be in God's sight is not a prostitute. It's a merchant. A money grubber. Why do you think the whole world accuses the Jews of being money hungry? 
That is the number one accusation against us. The Jews have all the money. Do yourself a favor and Google greedy merchant. Hmm. And you know what's going to come up? A bunch of cartoons that are in the world right now of a Jew going like this. <laughs> I did it yesterday. And it made me cry. I didn't type in Jew. I didn't type in Jewish merchant. I typed in greedy merchant. And this is what comes up. And just the opposite is true. The Gentiles are full of greed. And the Jews are trying to serve God. When the Jew starts acting like a Gentile with greed, that's when things go south. And there's a chapter in uh, Hoshea that says it. God talks to Ephraim, which is Israel, and he says, you are full of greed as merchants, and you rip everybody off. And it tells why. It tells because they turn to the way of the Gentile. But that's not normal. Okay. All of that was one picture. Now we're going to look at the second picture. What time is it? 12.05. Perfect. Abraham was old. The Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had in charge of all, all that he owned, Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you shall not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the merchants, of the Canaanites, but go to my country, Babylon, or or Assyria, and to my relatives, and take a wife for my son Isaac, the God of heaven who took me from my father's house, and he swore to me, saying, To your seed I'll give this land. He will send his angel before you. So the servant swore to him concerning this matter, and the servant took ten camels. Now, the, when you read this, it makes it sound like the camels are heavily laden with all kinds of good things from Abraham. Not what it says in Hebrew. It says he took ten camels, and it probably did have a lot of really good stuff on the camels, and set out, and all the best of his master was in his hand, is what it says. All the best of his master was in his hand. That's not what it says in English. It makes it sound like he's, that camels are loaded up with all kinds of stuff from Abraham. Not true. So it says in Genesis Rabbah about that, listen, all the best of his master is in his hand. How can you take all the best of Abraham and stick it in one hand? How is that possible? It's a dowry. Yeah, but how is he going to put all that in one hand? That would have to be a house full of stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is what the rabbis say. He wrote a gift deed. A gift deed, like an inheritance. He said, he wrote it out, to Isaac goes everything I own. It doesn't go to Ishmael. It goes to Isaac. He says he get, uh, wrote a gift deed to Isaac for everything he owned so that he would, so that he, they, sorry, they, um, Lavan and his family, so they would hasten, literally says jump, so they jumped to send him their daughter. So he's, he's sending him with the thing, saying, look, look how much I, uh, Ishmael, uh, sorry, look how much Isaac has. He, he's a bazillionaire. And so they're like, oh, we're going to give you our daughter. Absolutely. We want that stuff. Because he knows how they are. They're merchants. And they want that stuff. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city of the, by the well. He said, Lord, God of my master Abraham, please, not nah, grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. May it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so I can drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels too. That's a pretty specific prayer, isn't it? Yes. Very specific. He's saying, God, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, oh, will you please give me a drink? And then I need to have some girl say, Look, I'll, I'll give you a drink, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to water your camels too. Do you know what that means? Well, That's like a, a yeah, <laughs> they're right. It's like a three-hour job. Like you gotta go get water and go put it in a trough and go back and put it in a trough and go back and put it in a trough. And camels can drink a lot. 
I think it's 70 gallons in one shot. And how many camels are there? Ten. 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 So this is a huge job. So he's saying, you know, I want this big, big sign. Uh, let's see, drink and water. She is the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. That's how it says it in Hebrew. She is who you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I'll know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he even finished speaking with God, Rivka came out with her jar on her shoulder, and the girl was very beautiful. She was a virgin. Guess how old she was? Twelve. Twelve? The rabbis say three. Oh. What? <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. The rabbis say she was three years old. And she carried all the water? I don't know. I'm just saying. I don't think so. <laughs> Boy, we sure got a reaction out of that one. That was not one of them. Before you speak, do your research. I will. All right. So before he finishes speaking, Rivka came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up and she said, I will draw also for your camels until they've finished drinking. When the camels had finished drinking, the man, why doesn't it use his name like it did Ephron? <coughs> it said Ephron seven times. Here, it only gives Eliezer once. And then it says, the man took a gold nose ring whose weight was one half shekel and two bracelets to put on her hands whose weight was ten gold shekels. Then the girl, that's a lot of money, ten gold shekels. Today, ten gold shekels is $20,000. That's one bracelet. That's today. That's not back then. It's a lot more back then. Today, it's worth $20,000. Um, and I know that because I've done the research, and it actually happened. It actually happened. Somebody gave to uh, the congregation, out of the kindness of their heart, one troy ounce of gold. Wow. It was, it's worth $2,000. A shekel is about the size of this coin. And uh, that's $2,000 a shekel for a gold shekel. And these are how many shekels? For each bracelet, how many shekels? Ten. Ten. Hello, how many shekels per bracelet? Ten. Ten. Say it, ten. ten. That's $20,000. But that's in today's market. Back then it was a whole lot more. And he pulls these two big giant bracelets out to put on her hands, 10 shekels of gold each. Then the girl ran and told her mother's house about these things. Rivka had a brother named Lavan, and Lavan ran to the man. Isn't that what the rabbi said, that, that he gave them the deed so that they would run because they saw the stuff and they're running after that money and they know it. They know they're going to run after this money. And so Abraham gives him the deed that says, I'm giving everything to Isaac. Yes. So the, so the weight was 10 gold shekels, which you're saying is 20,000, but there was two bracelets, so it's 40,000. Okay, 000. you're ahead of the game. Oh. Hmm. I said 20,000 in our valuation, right, right, not Bible. Right. When he saw the ring, Levon ran to the man outside, well, then say 10 to, to the fountain. Could be for both. No, it's, it's each. No, it's each. Each, each one is 10. When he saw the ring, he saw the ring, and he saw these giant bracelets on his sister's wrist. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, he said, Come, blessed of the Lord! Why should you stand outside? Look, I've made the house ready and a place for the camels. Come on in! Just like Ephraim. He wants that stuff. You should know this, that in the Haggadah, when we first start telling the story, the very beginning of the story in the Haggadah, it says, and they tried to kill all of us, not just one Jew, mm -hmm. all the, not just one generation, but every Jew in every generation. Doesn't it say, Lavan the Aramean sought to kill the Jews? Yes. This is not a good guy. Lavan is, 
He's as probably as bad as Edom. Mm -hmm. There's our beautiful Rivka, our three-year-old. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when the camel had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring, and that's what it says in Hebrew, by the way, a gold nose ring, whose weight was one half shekel, and two bracelets to put on her hands, whose weight was ten gold shekels. Then the girl ran, told her mother's house about these things. Now, a half shekel, this is what the rabbis say. Big revelation to me, this is, you know, like kindergarten. This alludes to the shekels of Israel. Half a shekel per head. This story alludes to the shekels of Israel. Half a shekel per head. Mm. That's in Targum Jonathan. That's how it reads in Targum Jonathan. Like when I, I got a Brit? No, That's when we gave a half a shekel, which we'll get to. Okay. And two bracelets. This is an allusion to the two tablets mm -hmm. paired together. Genesis Rabbah 60 says this, and Targum Jonathan says this, weighing 10 gold shekels. That's an allusion to the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. So all of this the gift that was given to Rachel, sorry, to Rivka, all of these gifts that were given to Rivka, to Rebecca, they're a picture for us to see about God giving to Israel and Israel giving to God. So how do we know about the half shekel? Exodus 30. This is what everyone who is numbered shall give. A shekel, sorry, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekels were worth 20 gerah. Half a shekel as a terumah to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered from 20 years old and over shall give the terumah to the Lord. The rich shall not pay more, the poor shall not pay less than the half shekel. In other words, Every single Jew is worth what? Half shekel. Half shekel. So a half shekel, what's it a picture of? A Jew. A Jew. A Jew. That's simple. You see a half shekel? That's a Jew. That is a Jew. Uh, then the half shekel. When you give the terumah to the Lord to make atonement for you. Exodus 38. Later on, it says the same thing. The silver of those of the congregation who were numbered, a becca. Now, becca means cut in half or cleaved. And that's why it's a half a shekel. It's cut. It's cleaved in half. A becca per skull. Remember, I did that teaching about the skulls. God doesn't count by heads. He counts by skulls. Gurgulot. Half a shekel. That is half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. So basically, he stuck that on her nose. Why? It's a Jew. Right? He gave her a Jew. That's a Jew. Here, I'm giving you a Jew. Who did it? Marking her? No, 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 that's what I'm saying. I'm giving you a Jew. Who, were, who was she being given? Isaac. Uh, Isaac. Isaac. Right? Isaac. She's being given the deed to everything that, that I, uh, Isaac is going to get from Abraham. Yes. And she's getting the man, Isaac. So Eliezer goes, here, here, stick this in your nose. There, that's a Jew. I'm giving you a Jew, a half a shekel. That's what the rabbis say. It's a picture of that. But then the two bracelets. I don't know that I made these bracelets big enough. Ten shekels. That shekel was about the size, a little bit less than a quarter. A little bit less than the size of a quarter. If you had ten of those, would that make one of these bracelets? What do you think? Do you think I made it big enough or no? No, that's like eight. What do you think? It's like eight. <laughs> All right. I accept your valuation. So half a shekel. This alludes to the shekels of Israel. Half a shekel per head. The two bracelets in allusion to the two tablets paired together. Uh, and ten, weighing ten gold shekels. That's an allusion to the ten commandments inscribed on them. Exodus 31. When he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moshe the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written by the finger of God. So now what's she getting on her hands? What's she getting on her hands? Tablets of stone. Come on. The tablets of the, 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 the ten words? The Torah, the ten words, yes? The ten, yes. I'll say the ten commandments. On her hands. what? Hands. 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 All right. That's the deeds of Israel. Hmm. 
that's doing Judaism, putting the Torah on her hands. When we do the, the tefillin, we put, you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and, and as bands between your eyes. A sign upon your hand. And that's Judaism. Exodus 32, uh, verse 15. Moshe turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets which were written on both sides. Both sides. Not just two tablets. Two sides. Both sides. Front and back. Yes? Yeah. A lot of twos happening here. A lot of doubles. <coughs> yeah, don't that, they also say that the, that the, the tablets, you could see through, the, the words would go all the way through as if they were, you know, just like Yes, the, the letters would go all the way through. So you could see it on both sides. Yes, you could it. see it on both sides. Mm -hmm. Exodus 34, 1 and 4. The Lord said to Moshe, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the first ones. Why do you have to do that? Because on the, right, on 17th of Tammuz, you smash the first set. Therefore, how many sets of tablets are there? Two. There's another two. Two stone tablets, two sets, two sides. Two bracelets with weighing ten apiece. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. One weighs ten, the other weighs ten. Because they're, they're both tens, because there's two tablets. Two sets of tablets. Two sides of the tablets. Now, this stuff that she was given is God's business. And this is going to be very, very, very simple. Uh, how do you buy without money? How do you buy without money? Trade. Barter. Barter, trade, right? That's it. That's the answer. That's what merchants do. Only they do it with greed. God does it. He makes an exchange. There has to be a trade. Now, let's go back to this song that we sang. Come, you who have no money, buy. How can you buy if you don't have money? That's the business of God. We're able to buy without money. How do we buy without money? We do Judaism. I'm going to go back to the beginning of what I said. The rabbis say in the very beginning... Of Pirkei Avot. That we're to... Let me say it this way. We're supposed to buy without money, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? It says, make God your business, your trade, your money exchange. Make God your business. That should be your business. Not business. God should be your business. The other stuff, yeah, you do it to survive. Do you see what I'm saying? God is our business. That trade, that exchange is our business. Our mind should be on it all the time. And we got to make a good deal. And that's the hard part. we got to make a good deal. L -l -l Hold on, man. <laughs> Listen. When we stand before God, all he's going to care about, all he's going to care about is what we did. That's all he cares about. What, what did we do? Did you, like here's, here's the, the rubric, the scale. Did you do the things on that rubric? Did you do the things on that scale? Now, what did you get from doing the things on the scale? That's all he cares about. That's business. When you read the Torah and it says, you shall do something. And then you do it. But nothing happens. Who cares? There's no business transaction. But if you do it, and it teaches you some amazing revelation about God, you just did business. God, we did business together. I got something. I gave to you. You gave to me. I did the tzitzit. I got something from it. We did business. That's business. That's the business of God. This stuff that was given, the nose ring, the bracelets, that was Eliezer doing Abraham's business to get a bride 
for Ishmael, uh, for, I keep saying that, for Isaac, yes? Yes. yes? Okay. So here's how I read the passage. Here's how I read the passage. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rivka had a brother named Lavan, and Lavan ran to the man outside the fountain. The man ran outside to the fountain, and Lavan ran to the man. What man? Outside. Why does it say outside? Did he run in a house? To the fountain. Why does it say to the fountain? So I read that, and I'm like, what? This is all wrong in Hebrew. This is really, really badly phrased in Hebrew. The girl ran and told her mother's household about these things, and Rivka had a brother named Levan. And Levan ran to the man, who is unnamed, outside to the fountain. Okay. Now, if you just read it normally, it was like if you read in the Bible, it'll say, and Levan ran outside to the man who was at the fountain. That's not what it's saying. <coughs> it's a picture. Lavan ran. Here's what it says in Genesis Rabbah. Why did he run? What was he running for? Now it came to pass when he saw the nose ring. And he said, this person is rich. He set his eyes on the money. Just like Ephraim. That's why he ran. He wanted the stuff. I read it different. I read it like this. And Lavan ran to the man. The man is Messiah in Judaism. Did you know that? And I've given you two, only two passages here. There's a bunch in the Talmud. I've only given us two, just because for the sake of time. Rabbi Levi said, if a person murdered someone and was not killed as punishment, when will he be killed? When will he, you know, judgment happen? It will be when the man will come. The Messiah. Those are not my words. The Messiah, that's in the text of the Talmud. Sorry, of the, uh, the Midrash. It will be when the man will come. The man is the Messiah. The feet of a poor man, the King Messiah, who is referred to as a poor man riding on a donkey in Zechariah chapter uh, 12. 12. The feet of a poor man, the King Messiah, who is referred to as a poor man riding on a donkey. So when you read in the Bible just the word man by itself, it's the Messiah. So this is how I read it. And Lavan, do you know what his name means? White. white. White, yeah. And the white guy, the guy who's been made white. Pure. The guy who's been made pure. Not Lavan the merchant. Lavan the white guy who is still a merchant. His name is White. So you see what I'm saying? There's somebody here who looks righteous, but he's a merchant. He wants the money. And he runs to the Messiah. He runs to the Messiah. And the Messiah is outside the camp. Now why does it have outside, outside, outside the camp? Where does it say Messiah is outside the camp? In the field, the king. No, where does it say Messiah who is outside the camp? Ah, oh, come on, you should know this. Paul wrote that. It's in Hebrews. In Hebrews, let us go to him who is outside the camp and suffer the way he suffered. You should know that. It's in the New Testament. You should know it. So, he's outside the camp. He's the Messiah. And then it says, to the fountain. Isaiah 12 says, Yeshua." Right? It calls it the fountain of salvation. Maim Chaim, living water. And Yeshua, in John chapter four, uh, John chapter. 8 says at, at uh, Hoshana Rabbah, anybody who's thirsty, come to me and drink, and you'll drink from what? The fountain. The fountain, the ayin, which is the word used here. He ran to the man outside to the fountain. The fountain is the man. It is the Messiah. But we got a problem here. This is Levan. Hmm. He looks white. But he is a money-grubbing merchant. Have you figured out who this guy is yet? He's running to Jesus. Jesus. Christianity? Jesus. Yes. 
This is Christianity. It looks, I've been washed in the blood. Okay, you're white. You are. But you're still a money-grubbing merchant. Get rid of it and learn Judaism. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah. That was a long way to get to that punchline. <laughs> <laughs> I set you up for a long time. Cool. So this is God's business. Hoi! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. This is not going to happen for normative Hellenistic Christianity. It can't. Because there's no, there's no exchange. There's no exchange. It's a different kind of business. It's only the business that works in Judaism. Where he gives to me and I give to him. He's already given it to us. Judaism. And then I get something from it. And we both benefit. But without the actual acts of Judaism... All there can be, all there can be, literally, is this. I'm going to make a good deal today. I'm going to make a good deal today. I'm going to make some money. Uh, you know, God's going to help me. He's going to bless me. Just like Ephron said, God's going to bless me. So really, really and truly, this story that's been around for 4,000 years has been repeated countless times throughout Judaism. And it's going to continue to be repeated countless times throughout Judaism, where the Jewish people are trying to form a relationship with God, and the world looks at it and goes, they've got all the money. How can I get some of that? This is not going to stop. It's going to get worse until you see the whole world consumed by Babylon, by merchant, merchanting, merchandise. But God says, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Well, then why does he use the word buy? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Why use the word buy if there's no money? Because it's a different currency. It's the currency of Judaism which produces faith. Matthew 13. This is where you're going to get lost if, you, if you're not lost yet. Hmm. So try to concentrate, because I have a hard time following this. The kingdom of heaven. What's the kingdom of heaven? Give me a synonym for the kingdom of heaven, please. The day of the Lord. Thank you, Eileen. The day of the Lord. What else? The kingdom. The kingdom. What else? The seventh day. What else? The Sabbath, what Yom else? Shekulo Yom Shekulo Shabbat, what else? Bayom Hohu. Bayom, no. Well, okay, Bayom Hohu. I'm sorry, Rest. I got lost there for a minute. Thank you. Rest. Very good. Let's read it like that. The day of the Lord, the seventh day, the kingdom, is like a treasure hidden in the field. It's a treasure, but it's hidden. Which a man found. How did he find it? He went looking for it. Right. He went digging for it. He went digging for it. And he found it. And then he rehides it. Why in the world would he do that? Because he doesn't own the field that the treasure's in. Because he doesn't own the field that the treasure's in. And what did you say? Nobody will steal it. Right. Nobody will steal it. So this is where I get lost. <clears throat> This is where I got lost. I'm like, oh, why, why rehide it? Don't you want to like, oh no, you don't want to share your treasure with everybody. That's stupid. God gave it to me. And that's when I figured it out. Wait a minute. I found it. I found it. It's not like, like you know, I found it. You used to have br a print bumper stickers that said I found it. Hmm. And it was talking about Jesus. You ever see those? I found it. And so I'm going to go share it with everybody. No! Our relationship is personal. And we show it and we learn from it and we, by doing Judaism. And it feeds us and only us. What I learn, I learn for me. Period. Not for you, not for my children, not for my wife, for me. Because that's a treasure I found. And it's my relationship with God. 
period. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. You've got to rehide it. And from joy over it, he goes, and then, this, I really got lost on this one, and then he sells everything he's got because he goes and he buys that field with the money he makes. Mm -hmm. That's God's business. That's God's commerce. Give everything. Give it all so that you can do Judaism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know that's a different twist on what Yeshua said. Nobody's ever, I've never heard that. But now I can see that. And I can see it primarily from the pattern that God set up from the beginning with Abraham. Same thing happened with Isaac. Same thing happened with Jacob. Same thing happened with David. Same thing happened with Moses. Same thing happened with all the prophets that they did business with God. And this keeps repeating over and over and over again. Revelation 3, Yeshua says, I advise you to buy from me gold. What? Hmm. What am I going to buy gold with? Right. What am I going to buy gold with? <clears throat> Guys, I'm asking you a question. What am I going to buy gold with? Money, I guess. But that's gold. Right. It, it makes no sense. He's, let me say it this way. I advise you to bring me your pastrami sandwich so I can give you a roast sandwich. Corned beef sandwich. Yeah. Barter. What, why? Right. Why? Barter. Right. So it's like, it makes no sense in the... In the, in the yeah, but it's not just gold. It's gold refined by fire. Right. So, so that you may become rich. And then God says, don't be rich. So obviously it's not talking about money. Right. Yes? He's talking about the economy, the business of God. Hoi kot sameh lechul maim. Ki et sok maim al sameh. Listen, ho, ho, hey, that's how you say it in English. Hey, you who have no money, come buy from me. And he's saying the same thing here. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so you can become rich. And white garments so you, become, you can clothe yourself. And that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I said to anoint your eyes. And if you get white garments, you are then lavan. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's where the trouble starts. You better make sure that you don't act like Levon, but act like Abraham and Isaac and Rivka. Not like Levon and his family, which is what most people do. Oh, Jesus, heal me, give to me. Oh, I heard him, he touched me. I love Jesus so much. Hey, everybody, let's start a business and we'll make money for God. And we'll write a book, and we'll do a video, and we'll reach the world with the message of Christ. And this has been repeated a billion times. Instead of, that was for me. Thank you, God. I get to know you. I get to know you. Because I did Judaism. I get to know something about you. And leave it there. And if somebody wants to know, tell them. We're never going to make money for God. Never. It's not going to happen. It's not supposed to happen. Money's for existing. That's all. That's it. So, it's a whole different kind of business than you're used to. But to make it super simple, let just end with this. Don't just do Jewish stuff. Learn from every Jewish thing you do. You've got to open your ears to learn from every Jewish thing you do. If you do, you've got a chance of getting to know God. A better and better and better chance of getting to know Him. And it, just leave it there. It's for us personally. Let's pray. Thank you for sending the man, Lord. The man who's outside the camp, the fountain, I'm going to run to him. I am going to run to him. And Lord, I, I ask that you teach us the ways of Abraham, because we want the faith of Abraham. And I know that he did Judaism, so I'm going to do that. And I ask that you would show us amazing secrets and treasures 
out of your Torah. In the name of Yeshua, reveal to your body all over the world amazing secrets from your Torah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.